Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Sunday School Review. We're going to get into what God's Word and see what we can glean from the Word to apply to our everyday living. And the Word of God is full of power, full of joy, peace, and understanding. If we get into God's Word and stay there, and the old song says, stay there anyhow. My name is Ricky Pitts, and I'll be your Sunday School uh, teacher for today. I'm teaching on behalf of Bishop Nolan T. Torbert. I often forget to say that, but uh, just know that I'm, uh, I'm teaching uh, under his leadership. And uh, Bishop Nolan T. Torbert of True Deliverance Holiness Church, the pastor, founder, and overseer. And so I want you to get something from God's Word today that I think is going to be uh, really, really profound. Living in faith. Living in faith. That's Acts chapter 6, verses, verse 7 through 15. And it's a very, very powerful, powerful lesson. But I want you to think about also a few questions as we, as we dive into this lesson today. And I think these questions are going to really make us all think about uh, what, we, what we're trying to get from our lesson today. Number one, in what ways can believers develop spiritual power? Number two, how can mature believers leverage their power to encourage the spiritual growth of new believers? And number three, what steps will you take to ensure that your speech is filled with wisdom? You hear folks say it's not what you say, but it's how you say it. It's not, you know, the words are very, very powerful. Be careful what you, what you say and who you say it to. Well, the context of our lesson, let's, let's look at that first, and we'll get into uh, the verse by verse and then go on from there. After Jesus' ascension, the number of believers increased and were added to the church, the numbers in Jerusalem, and the expanding number of believers led them to develop habits. Habits for their gathering and expectations for how they would treat each other. You read this in Acts chapter 2. And during that time, almost all believers were Jewish. However, they didn't all have the same cultural upbringing. Some lived in the Greek, Greek speaking portion of the Roman Empire, while others lived in the Jewish regions of Palestine. And the differences between these groups of first century Jews led to conflict regarding the treatment of widows. Read about, this, read about that in Acts chapter 6, verse 1. As a result, the apostles faced problems while trying to oversee the church. That's in the second verse of, of Acts chapter 6. And to ease the, the load for the apostles, what they did was they selected seven men to handle specific tasks. Read about this in Acts chapter 6, verse 3 and 4. And the book of Acts mentions two of those seven men in more detail. That's Philip in the 8th chapter and Stephen in the 6th chapter. And in some ways, the role of these seven men was very similar to the position of a deacon. Read about that in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8 through 13. The word deacon comes from the Greek word, the Greek noun, uh, diakonis. Which is not used in Acts, which is not used in Acts chapter six. However, a variation of that of that word does appear in Acts chapter six and is translated as ministry in Acts chapter six and verse four. The term describes some aspects of the work of apostles. So those that are aspiring to be deacons, those that are already deacons, got to be ready to carry that word. I'm sure many of them are ready to carry the word. We got. One of the deacons is teaching outside the school today. I can assure you, uh, Brother Fred is able to carry the word, and he's going to carry it uh, in, in Sunday school today uh, as well. So that's, uh, that's important to keep that in mind. Now, we're going to talk about the growing church, Acts chapter 6, verses 7 through 10. And I'm going to read the context, of the, the lesson first, and we'll get into a verse-by-verse -verse commentary. Verse 7. And the word, of, the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Cyrenians, and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. 
And we'll get into uh, part two of our lesson, the emboldened opposition. Verse number 11. Then they suborned men, which said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and called him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses, which said, this man ceased not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. In closing that, that our text, the Spirit gives us faith to stand out. The Spirit gives us faith to stand out. And the question is, will we stand out? Because the Holy Ghost has given us everything that we need to stand out, but it's going to be up to us to make the decision to, to stand out. You see, class, uh, the Word of God is right. Now, somebody else may be wrong, but the Word of God is right. And I'm going to read just a little bit of the, of the, the commentary today from each verse. And I want you to think about this because all this is in your Sunday school book as well. The growing church is what is the first part of our lesson. And the subtopic is disciples and priests. And in verse 17, we see the development. The development of the church was caused by not padded pews. That growing church was, was caused by not eloquent speakers and great singles, singers. It was caused by the word of God. Once you read Acts chapter 12 and verse 24. And when the, when the gospel is heard by willing hearts, it's going to bring forth spiritual fruit. You can't make anybody hear. You can't make anybody want to hear. You can't hog time and make them feel bad and, 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 and scold them and make them, make them hear. It's going to be a willing heart that brings forth spiritual fruit. I want you to read Luke chapter 8, verses 8 and 15. The word greatly implies something. It implies that the Jerusalem church membership grew rapidly as a result of the word of God. I want you to read Acts chapter 1, verse 15, Acts chapter 2, verse 41, Acts chapter 4, and verse 4. And counted among those believers were the relatively poor priests who served in the temple when it was that time their lot was chosen. I want you to read Luke chapter 1, verses 5. And then verses 8 through 10. And the first century historian Josephus estimated there were, in his guess, about 20,000 priests at that time that were that was that was around the altar, around the church at that time. And this verse also is clear that a great number of those priests were obedient to the faith. Also, a great number of those priests were not obedient to the faith. Very much what we have today in terms of ministers and preachers of the gospel, are preaching but not teaching, not living the song that they sing, not obedient to the faith. And that's very dangerous. We also see uh, the power and wonders up under the growing church in verse number eight. In verse eight indicates that Stephen was full of faith and power and did great wonders and miracles among the people. So it was incontrovertible. It was undeniable that he was led by the Spirit of God and had divine leadership on his side. The apostles also healed and restored people that were suffering from physical and also spiritual ailments. I want you to read Acts chapter 3 and verses 1 through 10 and Acts chapter 5 verses 14 through 16. So although Stephen was not an apostle, it was likely that Deacon, let me just call him Deacon Stephen, also did some of the same things the same miracles that the apostles did because Stephen believed in the death, burial, and resurrection. And Stephen was full. Stephen was full of the Holy Ghost and power. And that's a very, that's a great combination. So he had been chosen by God, Stephen had, to, 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 to witness the salvation. I want you to read Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 through 4. 
And also Acts 6 and 5 says this, that he was full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. So his life then demonstrated the spiritual power that had been promised by Jesus. The question we should always ask ourselves, what is our life demonstrating? What is our life displaying to John Q. Public? And what they see in our life, does it invite? Is our life inviting uh, to those that are out there in a, in a dying world? The growing church we see again in, in, in part C is wisdom and spirit. This is in verse number nine. So the libertines in verse number nine were Jewish people who had been liberated from slavery or they were descendants of those that had already been freed uh, from slavery. Then these other groups that were included was the Cyrenians and uh, they were from Northern Africa and also the uh, Alexandrian, Ale Alexandrians also was from uh, Egypt. And also other folks came from Cilicia and also Asia and which is you know, located in modern day Turkey. And just like Peter and John, Stephen proclaimed God's salvation in Jesus the, the Messiah. And he proclaimed it loudly and proudly, a public proclamation. And he, he didn't back down on the word of God. And once you read Acts chapter three, verses 12 through 26, the problem was the Jewish leadership in Jerusalem did not want him to preach that message. Stephen, you're a good guy. But I want you to see, I want you to, I want you to cease and desist. I want you to stop preaching about this name, about Jesus, and about being, being saved through him. Salvation through, through Jesus the Messiah. I want you to stop doing that. I want you to read Acts chapter 4 again, verse 13 through 18. But Jesus told his followers in advance, if y'all follow me, if y'all preach this gospel, you're going to face opposition. Let me just kind of put that out there right now. Now, if you can't take the heat, you might want to get on out of the kitchen now because you're going to face some opposition uh, in this kingdom message. Continuing with, continuing with wisdom, and, wisdom and spirit. In verse 10, we see that the synagogue members, the synagogue, the church members, were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. It was undeniable. This means that they had no answer to Stephen's powerful, divinely led teaching. In the very next chapter, in Acts chapter 7 and verse 51, it says this, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, do you always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. This is the very next chapter, Acts chapter 7. But Stephen was called and chosen not by a group, not by the Sanhedrin. He was called and chosen by God. And his words were powerful, and his, word were, his words were indisputable. And his words were led by, because this guy was filled with the Holy Ghost and with wisdom, and he was, he was led by the Lord. The Lord ordered his steps, and the Lord directed his path. Now, in section two of our lesson, we're talking about now the emboldened opposition. And there are many folks right now in the body of Christ don't want no opposition. Okay, don't, don't want to don't uh, stand for truth just in case somebody over here don't like what you say. Although what you're saying is based on the word of God and it's truth, but don't want, to, don't want any opposition. Well, there's going to be some opposition if you stand for the truth, if we stand for the truth. And so we see here now a conspiracy. And so in verse number 11, we see, in this 11th verse, we see the religious leaders were unable to win an argument with Stephen, so then they secretly persuaded or suborned men to speak against Stephen regarding his teaching. In other words, I want you all to tell a lie. I want you to tell a lie, but I want the lie to be very convincing. This is what these guys wanted these folks that they hired on to do against Stephen, suborn men. So the charge of the charge of blasphemous words meant very severe consequences for Stephen if he was convicted of such a such a crime. And the law of Moses, you see, prohibited blasphemous language against God, and prohibited prohibited blasph blasphemous language 
against the leaders of Israel. I want you to read Exodus chapter 20 and verse 7 and chapter 22 and verse 28. And so then the council we see now the, the, in this continued con conspiracy, the council in verse 12 refers to the Sanhedrin, this 70 member crew, group of men, uh, this Supreme Court justice of the land of that time. And this group right here had great influence in the first century Judaism. These were the guys, these guys, they were it these guys back at that time. And these guys consisted of them, just not lay people. This, this group consisted of the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. I want you to read Mark 15 and 1. And members of the Sadducees and Pharisees, another very influential group of, of that day, were also very likely a part of this Sanhedrin uh, Supreme Court justice to some extent. And they had a lot of power and prestige. I want you to read Acts chapter 23 and verse number six. So the Sanhedrin had the power then, as I mentioned earlier, to, to, to level severe consequences for any offenders of the law. And Stephen would not be any exception, although they was lying on him, trying to set him up, getting folks to lie, to, to lie on him, and getting folks hired to lie on him. They, they, had, they had an end for him because they threatened some of their livelihood, we'll see that here in just a moment. I want you to read John 9, 22, Acts 15, 17 through 40. So any claim that would, would have stirred up the people and the religious leaders, that they stirred up the people and the leaders, it was a serious situation. So now we go on to the witnesses uh, under this emboldened opposition. In verse 13, we see that the people stirred up false witnesses, not true witnesses. They stirred up false witnesses, even though the law of Moses clearly states, and these guys were masters of the law. They knew the word of God inside and out. And the law of Moses clearly says, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. That's in the book of, that's in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 16, the five books of the law. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. This is the second book of the law. Exodus 20 and 16. So the Supreme Court, the Sanhedrin, met in a chamber, look, listen at this, connected to the temple. The, the Supreme Court justice had a chamber connected to the temple. And so the charge that they heard uh, about Stephen preaching blasphemous words against this holy place, blasphemy was a, as I mentioned earlier, a severe offense. And it had very serious consequences if tried and convicted. I want you to read Le Leviticus chapter 24 and verses 10 through 16. And now we go on with a little, a little bit more detail on these witnesses here in verse 14a. Verse 14a says again, for we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place. And so then their, their claim, their claim, what they said, had a grain of truth. And that's just like the enemy uses a grain of truth. Isn't it just like any kind of false doctrine can use a grain of truth of God's word to form a whole following? Not the whole, not the whole counsel, but a grain of truth. In Luke chapter 21, verse five and six, Jesus prophesies regarding the destruction of the temple, a grain of truth to what these guys said. He also proclaimed in John, in John uh, uh, chapter two and verse 19, destroyed this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. However, the apostle John interpreted this statement as a metaphor for the body of Jesus, you see. And so in John 2, 20, 2, 21, Jesus never claimed uh, that he himself would destroy the temple, but he also, he also faced similar charges that Stephen faced in Matthew 26, 60 through 61. And the whole point of Jesus' teaching was to, to serve as a prophetic reminder regarding the, regarding, the, regarding the temporary nature of that structure, of that temple. I want you to read Matthew chapter 24, verses 18 through 25. But in AD 70, the prophecies that Jesus 
let them know about regarding the temple were fulfilled when the Roman commander Titus tore it up, just destroyed and tore down the temple, just ravaged the temple and just, and then it just came to pass what Jesus had already said. His word always come to pass, class. Just wait on it. He may not come when you want him, but he's always right on time. Verse 14b, still talking about these witnesses. And some, and, and, shall, and it says, and shall change the custom which Moses delivered us. And shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. Some of the customs that Moses and the law was circumcision. circumcision. Some of the custom was dietary practices. And all these things were a way for the Jewish people to keep themselves separated, distinguish themselves from the Gentile people. The reason why we are pure we're, and we're, we're pure Jews is because we don't eat this kind of food. And all, all the boys got to be circumcised by a certain time. And y'all Gentiles don't do it. So that's why we know who we are and you who you are. That, that, that's our separation point. So, so, so any teaching regarding a change in any of these things that were going to affect their uniquely identity as a people was, was going to be a problem. And so all parts of the Hebrew scripture then, all parts of the Hebrew scripture serve as guideposts. What kind of guideposts? That point people to Jesus. So you see, Jesus, Jesus did not come to nullify the word of God. He came to fulfill the word of God. And he did that with his life, with his death, and with his resurrection. He fulfilled. I want you to read Luke chapter 24 and verses 27 to verse 44. So you see, the temple provided, well, it really did provide wealth and money and increase for a lot of these power players, these elitist people. Uh, these big dogs in the in the in the in the in the gospel back at that time, in the law, I should say, in that, in that time. And so, I want you to read Matthew chapter twenty-one and verse twelve. And because the Sadducees and the elite members of the priesthood, well, they benefited from the the economic well the economic engine of the temple. A lot of folks came in at that time. There was a whole lot going on, and uh, and so those things that that. That process, those those uh, logistics that took place in the temple back at that time, profited a lot of these big dogs. Again, the the, the, the priests and priesthood, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, um, these religious bosses. Let's call them religious bosses. And they did not want Jesus or anybody else to disrupt that money machine. So now we go down to verse fifteen. We're talking about the, the steadfast man right here now. The steadfast man in verse number, yeah, verse number 15. The phrase face of an angel in verse 15 highlights something. It highlights the supernatural nature of the expression on, on Stephen's face. And that should have gave them some kind of clue. And look at this man's face. This man's face is not a natural looking face. Something is uniquely different about this guy named Stephen. Look at this guy's face. It looks like a face of an angel. And that should have gave them some idea that this guy is on the Lord's side. Other folks also in the word of God, you saw them that when they came in contact with Jesus, there was a change in their countenance. You see? So, I mean, think about our own. They saw God's glory. Think about our own life. Once we become born again, if I baptize and we got Jesus on our mind, People should see a difference, and it should be a noticeable difference. Um, I, I don't, you know, people that are born again, there are certain things they just don't do because they have standards. I won't get into naming those things, but uh, I think all of us know what those things are. We There's got to be a difference. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen began his testimony in that seventh chapter of, of the book of Acts. He, he testified to the Sanhedrin council by referring to the glory of God. And in Acts chapter seven, verse 55 to Acts eight and one, he concluded his testimony, came to a conclusion of his testimony, and Stephen got a, a, a real view of heaven during his testimony. And he saw the glory of God, look at what he saw, and he said, he said it, he saw the glory of God and he saw Jesus standing on the right hand of God. 
And when and when that council, when that Sanhedrin council heard him say that, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. And boy, they came and they, they stormed him and then they, they, they stormed him and stoned him, the people did. Because they didn't understand it. And Stephen, and Stephen, during all this problem and, and stoning and killing, asked God not to lay this charge to their heart. Still forgave them. My goodness, ain't that something? Which tells us we got a long way to go and we ain't got a long time to get there. And so now, and, and uh, we also see in verse 15, uh, let's see here. Well, class, you know what? I, I want to, there's a, I don't have time to read it. I, I don't, but I'm, I'm going to say it, like, I'm just saying this way right here. All of us should at some point sit down and, and look at what can move us. I'm not saying study what can move us. I'm saying do a self-examination. A self-examination as to what condition can take place, what, what confrontation can take place that can, can cause us to act out of character. Even though the person, that, the person that's against us is clearly wrong. You got cut off in on the interstate. The guy pulled right in front of you and you was about to get into a parking place and the guy just pulled as if you don't even exist and got out of the car and looked at you like you were wrong. The guy that, that got behind you and just started honking the horn, honking the horn, honking the horn, and you got an 18 wheel in front of you that you can't move. And the guy, and you look and you look back and say, sir, I can't move. And the guy those gives you two birds, a bird with the left hand and a bird with the right hand. And then and says some real bad words. How do you deal with that? You see, we're talking about living in the faith. We're talking about living the song that we sing. We're talking about practicing what we preach. We're talking about tolerance. We're talking about patience. We're talking about endurance, forbearance. We're talking about showing love in the midst of a whole lot of hate. How do we deal with that? How do we live, live our faith out? Whether you're a deacon, a minister, a, a missionary, a choir director, a choir member, a pew warmer, how do you live it out? Class, I, th I thank y'all for logging into our class today. And I hope you've learned something uh, from the word of God today. And we look forward to seeing you again next week for our next Sunday School Review. Y'all take care.